stand up for our water prayer our gracious and loving heavenly father we come before your holy presence in the name of our lord jesus christ this afternoon open our hearts open our ears that we may hear what the spirit of the lord is speaking to the churches and is speaking to this nation in these last days give us an understanding heart and give us a listening ear that we may hear what the lord is speaking to us and the direction which he is showing to us in the name of the lord jesus christ we pray amen please be seated since the whole of yesterday i do not know what was preached this morning but yesterday you heard about myself and the other two speakers bringing words of judgments and you will know that uh when i minister in the morning the other two speakers were not there but when they brought the messages it all lined up like part 1 part 2 part 3 like confirming one another am i right everybody yes. it was like confirming and reconfirming what was spoken in the first message and the one word that you keep on hearing continuously was of the judgment and uh, yes last night as i was um, after we went back to our hotel rooms and as i was uh, waiting i had a visitation from an angel of god who told me to wait at god at 10 am the following morning so and uh, god would want to speak so this morning at 10 am i waited before god at the appointed time and as i waited i was caught up to heaven to participate at a council of prophets in heaven you know in heaven there are many many councils and among the one council there is a council of the prophets and this prophets council chiefly is concerned or it oversees the last days events that are going to take place on this earth there are many many gatherings in heaven you know the the one thing that we are all most familiar with is a worship service in heaven most of us are only familiar with that because that's what we chiefly read in the book of revelation that everybody gather and they are worshiping god so somehow we all have a wrong notion that in heaven everybody worships 24/7 which is not true because there is worship that goes on in heaven continuously and that is done by the angels certain classes of angels are created for that purpose and they are in one secluded one part of heaven you know the bible says in my father's house are many mansions with the pula right and the the greek word for mansions is actually not mansions the word mansions is not correct it should be greek word is mone m o n e and mone means realms realms of existence so it's not a mansion like we would think a huge castle like buckingham palace no that's not the right translation it is plains or places of existence like for example you have newcastle i mean castle hill you have campbell town you have uh, chatswood you have this you have liverpool blackpool you have blackpool no black oh sorry you know liverpool is a city in england 
and there's also another city in England called Blackpool. So if you have Liverpool, I thought that you must have Blackpool. No Blackpool, all right. So like that, you know, suburbs where people live. Likewise, in heaven, there are these realms of existence or living. Or to make you feel a little comfortable, like let's call it suburbs. There are different, different suburbs. And in one such realm is where a class of angels specially created to worship God and fill the whole of heaven with praise. And their job or their created purpose is to continuously lift up praise all throughout. For lack of a better word, let's use the word day. Because in heaven there is no day, no night. So it's one complete eternity. So their job or Job, again, is not the right word. Created purpose is to worship and praise God all continually. Now, that is one place. But there is a time in heaven where all beings, created beings in heaven, together with all the redeemed saints, they all gather together to worship God. Like, for example, on a, your Sunday church service. Six days of a week, you go to work. Then on a Sunday, you gather, everybody gather to worship God. This you read in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, where the Bible says, there was a day when the sons of God all gathered before God. So that is called a general worship. And in Revelation, you read about that continually in chapter 7. Where all the angels and all the redeemed saints, together with the 24 elders, they all worshipped God. So there is a special time where a worship, general worship service takes place in heaven. But besides all this, there are so many other activities that take place in heaven. If you read the book of Revelation very carefully... You will find a lot of activities that keeps on going in one place of heaven. If you read chapter 8, you will find the angels bringing bowls of prayer before God. So if they are worshipping God all 24-7, so where do they have time to bring bowls of prayer? And then in chapter 5, you will read, the 24 elders receive the bowls of prayer and they offer before God. So if the 24 elders are also engaged in worshipping all 24 hours, so where do they find the time to receive these bowls of prayer to offer unto God? And then you'll read in Revelation chapter 12 that the angels, Michael and his angels, are engaged in war. If Michael and his angels are also involved in worship all 24 hours, where are they going to find time to go and fight war? So there are so many activities take place all the time. And then in chapter 15 you read that there were seven special angels appointed to pour the wrath of God upon the whole earth. And then in chapter 8 and chapter 9 you read seven angels blowing trumpets upon the world. So if all the angels and all the beings are involved in just worshipping God all the time, then where do all these angels find other times to do all these other works? So, let's establish once and for all this correct understanding that heaven is a place where there is a myriad of activities. Different, different activities that take place all the time. Among all the activities, there is one activity at a certain appointed time where all the beings, you know, even some beings from other planets, other worlds created by God, they all come, congregate to worship God. Besides that, we have all these other things. Now, there's a council in heaven. You read of this in the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 18. It says, for who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Or who has paid attention to his word and listened? So there you have one scripture. 
So before I share with you what I was shown, I want to just give you some scriptural proofs for such uh, encounters and experience so that our faith is not built on some subjectivity but solidly, objectively on the word of God. And in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9, Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. To whom is God saying? He's not saying to everybody. That scripture is followed or linked together with Amos chapter 3, verse 7. For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. The prophets here do not necessarily mean the prophets on this earth, but the prophet saints who are also in heaven. If you read Revelation chapter 1, you'll read that when God, the Lord Jesus spoke to the prophet John or the apostle John, the Bible says he sent his angel to communicate to John the things that are to come. But then you read in chapter 19 and chapter 22 that this angel is really not an angel. Especially if you read Revelation chapter 22 verse 8 and 9. He's not really an angel because when John fell down at the feet of the angel... To worship him, the angel will say to him, don't do that. You should only worship God. I am your fellow brother and of the prophets. No, no angel will come up to you and say, I am your brother or I am your sister. Angels cannot say that because they are created by God as ministering spirits. They don't have the spirit of or they are not created in the image of God. So the angels will never come up to you and say, Hello brother. If any angel, if, if you ever had an encounter with an angel, who comes and say, Hello bro. <laughs> Number one, it means one of two things. Number one, he is not an angel, he may be a saint of God. Number two, he is not an angel at all. Somebody real who come up to say, Hello brother. So please remember this. So when this angel told John, I am your brother and your fellow prophet. So that confirms the identity of who this angel is. He is none other than a prophet of a bygone era. So the prophets are in heaven and God reveals his secrets first to this council. He gathers all these prophets together unto him and he tells them, this is what I intend to do. What do you all think about it? He first reveals his secrets to them. And uh, then, after getting a consensus, their opinions and all that, and of course, God doesn't need to ask for the opinion. You know, you have an example there in Genesis chapter 18. The Lord had already decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But he said, let me discuss this over with Abraham. This is what I'm going to do. What do you think about it? And then that gave an opportunity. You know, when God comes and shows us something, it is not for us to triumph over or gloat over what God has said. Most of the time, we should do exactly like what Abraham did to intercede. That is the purpose God is giving us revelation. One is to communicate and the other is to intercede. And the other scriptural example I want to show you is 1 Kings chapter 22 verses 19 to 23. And Micaiah said... Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab 
that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead. See, look at verse 19. The all the hosts of heaven standing beside him on the right hand, on the left hand, and the Lord asks them a question. Who will do this or who will do that? You read of a similar thing in Isaiah chapter 6 where the Lord asks, Who shall go on my behalf? See, if, now you, you just imagine in your mind like this. If Isaiah was the only one standing there and he saw the vision, why must God ask who will go on my behalf? Right? The question would have been, will you go on my behalf? Am I right everybody? Yes. Grammatically, that's how it should be. But for God to say, who will go on my behalf? It simply means, Isaiah was not the only one standing there. In a crowd like this, Isaiah was just one among them. And then the Lord looked around and said, who will go on my behalf? And maybe several hands went up or several hands didn't go. Only Isaiah's hand went up. So this is another scene, scene where the Lord discusses his plans with the, before the council, before doing anything on the earth. So this being your scriptural background, now let me share with you what happened this morning. So this morning at 10 o'clock, I was brought before this council where there are about seven or eight prophets, ancient prophets. And the chairman of this council is none other than Abraham himself. And there's, there's uh, Moses in the council, Jeremiah, Elijah, the apostle Paul, and those ancient ones. And uh, I have been in this council many, many times. It, it has been my merciful grace privilege granted by God to be at the council. So this morning when I was there, the discussion was about Australia. That was the discussion. And that was the purpose I was called to witness what is what is being discussed and then to come and share with you. This is one of the call that God gave me several years ago. He said, as a prophet, not only you will hear, but you will participate in the council in heaven and hear what is being spoken and then communicate to the people. I first saw this before I was officially given this call. You know, we have our dear Pastor Elizabeth in our midst. Uh, do you all know Pastor Elizabeth? Yes. Let's give a good clap to Pastor Elizabeth. She is one of the pioneer ministers in this city who has labored very much for the Lord and God has given her wonderful anointing for deliverances. And uh, she has pioneered Indonesian church and does even in her very young age today. She goes about doing a great work for the Lord. Selamat datang. And she is a precious woman of God. I remember, I think the first or the second time when I came to Australia, she, she and her church was part of the committee. And uh, I, I cannot remember it was whether the was the beginning of the convention or the post of the con conference when the committee was all praying together. And uh, they were all praying for one another. As I was closing my eyes in prayer, I saw heavens open and that was the first time I saw the council. But at that time I was not in the council, I was just a spectator. And when I saw the council, they were hearing the prayer that was being prayed on this earth. And then one of the saints there, he said, look at Elizabeth's face. And everybody were closing their eyes and they were praying, you know. And uh, when I opened my eyes, I saw her, there was light, a glow shining on her face. 
and then the word of the Lord came for her concerning at that time she was going to do you remember this do you remember yes she was going to build a church construct a church and she was going to real hell warfare and that word from the Lord really boosted her that day to keep on going on the project so that was the first time that I saw in, in the council but now sitting there participating in the council on a, everyone sits around the table like a round table conference table and there was a huge map of Australia on the table and the Saint Abraham took something like a pen or I don't know what it was he drew a line straight from the northernmost part of the land down to the southernmost part and then he drew another line across so like the country was divided into four parts you know right at the intersection where two lines meet two angels were stationed there they appeared and then the angels who were there in the country they were now presenting their report before the council if you read Genesis chapter 18 two angels accompanied God to pronounce judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah and God came and told Abraham I will now go and see according to the things that my ears have heard concerning what is coming out of Sodom and Gomorrah and then the two angels were sent forth to go and see and report to God whether the cup is become full according to all the voices they are hearing coming from the land and whether they sh a judgment should be pronounced so two angels went forth and yesterday you heard brother Neville sharing that the same angels that went to Sodom and Gomorrah they were sent to Sydney to spy the land so now this is the report those two angels submitted before the council Sydney much sinful activity has been recorded so they write down in their on their iPads hey do you think only you have iPad <laughs> they have a better iPad that Apple will never keep on changing version 2 version 3 version 4 no iPhone 7, 8, 9, 10. No. Only one standard that lasts us for eternity. Amen? Okay. Now this is what they reported. I'm going to read to you exactly as how I heard in the council. Things they do in the night are so awful to be mentioned. Dogs are brought into gay clubs by women and sexual acts are committed men too commit these acts so much sexual perversion takes place in this city that makes Sodom and Gomorrah pale in comparison the two angels who visited Sodom and Gomorrah testified in the council when we visited Sodom and Gomorrah, only men were engaged in gross sexual acts. You read that in Genesis chapter 19 verses 4 and 5. But here in this city, it is women with women, mankind with animals, parents with children, and some grandparents with their grandchildren. These parents engage in sexual perversion with their children as if they were husbands and wives. Is it true? To the best of your knowledge? We saw babies strangled and killed. 
some in the name of medical science and some with violent brutality. They were even fed to the animals. Such things also takes place in India. Some hospitals who perform illegal abortions, they don't report them. They just throw those uh, fetuses. Some of the fetuses are not, they are really formed. They are thrown out on the dumpster where dogs all gather and the dogs eat those fleshes. And how do we know all this? Because there was an incident where it was reported to the, some public saw that, that the animals were, the dogs were eating some kind of a tissue and it looked like a small little baby. And the public reported to the police and they came, they found that whole area filled with baby bones. And then when they raided the hospital, they found that illegal abortions were done in the hospital. So, when this was reported, suddenly, one saint stood up with a righteous fire in his eyes. Elijah stood up and he asked a question. What is the church doing about it? With all this that's going on, what is the church doing about it? And the angels reported this. The purpose, the purpose of the order of the Melchizedek is to bring the rule and worship of God's kingdom to this world. That is the mission statement of the order of Melchizedek. To bring the rule and the worship of God's kingdom to this world. That's what Melchizedek did, stood for, and that is what the order of Melchizedek is. Okay, let's look at the historical Melchizedek. Now, Genesis chapter 14. You need to turn your Bibles. Those of you who didn't bring your Bibles, you can look up on the screen. Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 and 19. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. So here, we find the introduction of Melchizedek. Out of nowhere, he suddenly appeared. He suddenly showed up. The other character that you will read like Melchizedek who suddenly appeared is Elijah. He suddenly appeared. Now, concerning Elijah, you will, you will read, his father's name is not mentioned, his mother's name is not mentioned, and nothing about his background. You don't know anything about him. Out of nowhere, suddenly he appeared. What else? John the Baptist, you know his father, you know his mother, and you know where he was born. You know what? That he, it also says that he was in the wilderness till the time his ministry started. So at least about John the Baptist, you have some background information about his genealogy. But Elijah, you have nothing. He suddenly appeared. The same thing goes for Melchizedek. He suddenly appeared. And when he appeared, he is called the king of Salem. And then he brought with him bread and wine. And then he is called the priest of God Most High. So who is this Melchizedek? The word Melchizedek comes from two words. Melchizedek. Although in the English Bible it, it's coined together as one word, but in the Hebrew language there are two words. Melchizedek. Now the word Melchi comes from the Hebrew word Melech. M-E-L-E-K. And Melech means a royal king. 
And malak comes from the word malak, M-A-L-A-K, which means ascended the throne. Now, first I'll just give you all the definitions, then we'll put them all together. Now, the word sadek comes from the Hebrew word sadek, meaning T-S-E-D-E-Q. It means someone who is naturally right, upright, character-wise is righteous and morally righteous in deeds. So, Sadak means you are an upright person. Within you, your principles are upright and even all your deeds, they are righteous deeds. And the word Melchizedek means my king is the God Sadak. In the literal Hebrew, that's what it my, my king is the God Sadak, which means my king is righteousness. Or put, to put in a very simpler term, it means king of righteousness. So Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And the scriptures also says that he was the king of Salem. Now the word Salem is the Hebrew word Shalem. S-H-A-L-E-M. And Shalem is an early ancient name for Jerusalem. You find this in Psalm 76 verse 2. And the word Shalem means... A city that is completely friendly, peaceful, quiet, wholesome. So Shalem comes from a very primitive root word Shalam. S-H-A-L-A-M. It means to be safe in mind and body. It gives you the feeling of being complete, completed safe, protected in that city. So this Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of peace, rules a city that is completed. That means nothing is lacking there. None of its citizens complain against the king or against the government because everything is perfect. Number one. Number two, it is a peaceful, peaceful place. Peaceful, quiet, very, very conducive for living. place on this earth is like that. Everybody agrees? Such a place only exists in heaven. So this Melchizedek, king of righteousness and king of Shalem, actually rules over a city of peace and tranquility. This is the first thing that we need to know about Melchizedek. Now look at the other part about him. He is called a priest. Now the word priest in Hebrew is Kohen. K-O-H-E-N. It means a chief ruling priest. So he was a king. 
and he was a priest. Two things about Melchizedek. Now, whom, whom was Melchizedek worshipping? He was worshipping the Most High God. He was a priest of the Most High God. And the word Most High God in the Hebrew is El Elyon. E L E L Y O W N. And El Elyon means the Most High God who dwells on lofty mountains. Not just Most High God. You know, all the while when I hear the word El Elyon, I always thought the Most High God. But when I dig into the Hebrew words, I found something that confirmed the many, many visions that I've seen about the Father God's dwelling place. This, this word, El Elyon, confirmed that. The Most High God who dwells on lofty mountains. Not just high mountains. It's lofty. Lofty means high and great mountain. That's what lofty means. Now why, instead of just saying, Melchizedek was a priest of God, why use the word most high God? It's because during those period of time, the ancient world were not monoistic people. They were not worshipping one God. They were polyistic people, worshipping many, many gods. So among the many gods worship on earth, this God that Melchizedek worshipped and served is the highest, the most high God, a title that is given to the Lord God of the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14, God is called the most high God. And this high God, the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, and Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 14 dwells on high and lofty mountains. So that is the dwelling place of the Almighty Father God. You know, heaven is a wonderful place. But not everything about heaven is written in the Holy Bible. The, the many things that you read about heaven in the Bible is centered and focused only one place of heaven. And that is the place called the General Assembly of the Saints. In uh, Revelation chapter 5, you read the throne of God and then the living creatures and the 24 elders. That is one place in heaven. Then in chapter 7, you read where the Apostle John saw my rights of uncountable angels all standing and worshipping God. That is another place in heaven. Then in chapter 4, you read a sea of glass before the throne of God. See, all these things, you read the entire book of Revelation, is not describing one place in heaven, but the many different places in heaven. Is it really true or not? In John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, the Lord Jesus says, In my Father's house, there are many mansions. Amen? Amen. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. The word men... is wrong because the word mention in the Greek is called mone m-o-n-e 
an M O N E should be rightly translated as planes of existence. Different different areas, different planes of existence. That's what it really means. In my father's house, father's house meaning heaven. There are many different levels. Levels is not the right place, right word either. I used to think, you know, levels mean one level, another level, another level, right? In my younger days, that's what I thought. Until when I began to visit and have these wonderful experiences, I realized it's not level. It's runs, runs, and of existence. One place is here, another place is there, another place is over there. It's different, different areas. One area where all the sons of God dwell. They don't mix with anybody, you know. They dwell. They have their own separate places. Even angels of God, they have their own dwelling places. Different classes of angels, they live in different places. They all not lumped together. This class of angels, cherubims, all one place. Seraphim, all one area. Living creatures, all one area. Different different classes. Then the twenty-four elders, they, even the saints of God. When you come to heaven. According to our spiritual maturity, we will dwell in the places in heaven. So, among the many places in heaven, there is one separate place where the Father God abides, far away from any other dwelling place, and nobody can approach that place. And this was typified in the tabernacle, like the most holy place. See, no one can go into the most holy place. Even the high priest can only go in once a year. But there is a special group of people who find special favor from God, and to them, God grants this request. They can come and go whenever they like. That is like Moses. Moses could come and go whenever he liked. He need not only enter into the most holy place. Once a year, because he has found favor in the eyes of God, so the Father God dwells in a lofty place, and the place that I, when I first went there, what I saw is exactly like what the Scripture says: lofty mountains surrounded. The whole area is surrounded by very high, lofty mountains. You know. During my many years of ministry in Tibet, I've seen all these great mountains, and I'm always fascinated, and I feel so at home and at ease among the mountains. But the mountains in heaven are much more greater and beautiful than what you see on this earth. Mount Everest, which is the highest mountain. Will appear like a small toy, small ant, before the lofty mountains in heaven. So, it's a high. The Most High God dwells on lofty mountains. Now, this brings us to the next point. Melchizedek is a priest. What good is a priest if there is no temple? A priest must have a temple, right? Because that's where he is. So, where is the temple? The Bible tells us there is a temple in heaven, and the word temple is mentioned fourteen times in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter three verse twelve, seven verse fifteen, eleven verse nineteen, fourteen verse fifteen and seventeen. Chapter fifteen was five, six, and eight. Chapter sixteen was one and seventeen, and chapter twenty-one was twenty-two. Fourteen times the word temple is mentioned in heaven, meaning there really is a temple.
in heaven. And the word temple in the Greek is naos, N-A-O-S, meaning a shrine, a temple, or a sacred place. So now we'll put all these words together. So we come to a definition saying, Melchizedek. Now again, I am jumping a few things before, ahead. Melchizedek is no ordinary priest. Melchizedek is a kingly priest in the temple in heaven. So some may ask me right now, if he is a priest in heaven, how could he be on earth visiting Abraham? Now the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 3 verse 13, the scripture says, when the Lord Jesus was on earth, he was also in heaven at the same time. And Psalms 113 verse 5 and 6 also says, God can exist in two realms at the same time, in heaven and in earth at the same time. So Melchizedek was a priest in heaven. And in Genesis chapter 18 verse 1, we read that the God of heaven appeared unto Abraham. So when God visited Abraham, doesn't mean that heaven was empty. Am I right? See, the problem we have is this, you know. We try to interpret the Bible and the things of God according to how we are. Because you cannot be in two places at the same time, right? You are either here or you are there. So we try to imagine that God is also like that. How can he be on earth and in heaven at the same time? If he's here, means he's here. If he's there, means he's there. See, heaven does not work on our understanding. That the rules of heaven are different. So you cannot understand heavenly principles using our natural understanding. This is the barrier you must first break if you want to step into the most holy place. See, in the, the making of the tabernacle, there are three parts. In the first section, there is the outer court. In the outer court, you have the altar of burnt sacrifice. And then you have the lever of washing. The priests do work there. Then you go into the holy place. There are three furniture. The table of showbread, the lampstand, and the altar of incense. And the priests do work there. Every day they must burn incense. Every day they must light up the lamp. And every seven days they must change the bread. But the most holy place, there's only one furniture. No one is allowed in. And there is a thick curtain that separates the most holy place from the holy place. Once a year, the high priest enters in. Now, when the high priest goes in, he bears the blood of the lamb in his hand and he is walking. Nobody else can come with him, you know. Now, when he is holding the blood in his hand, how is he going to part the veil to go in? How? Because his hands are full of blood, he cannot touch. The Jewish mystics say, their tradition says, 